please listen to me. You've been abducted. And the individual that you're traveling with is highly dangerous. Oh, no, he's not dangerous. I mean, he's kind of rude. Hey! It's probing time. Uh. My favorite part of the film is how you successfully created the character, brought him to life, give him a physical presence, and really pull off the illusion of him being part of the cast. And I speak, of course, about Nick Frost. Um, <laughs> and uh, what technology went into that? Um, well, we put Nick Frost in a Nick Frost suit. <laughs> and, uh, and then for two and a half years, we animated him. Um, I always ask myself when I read a script, how am I suited for this? Because I have no illusions that I'm as good as, as say, Edgar Wright, for instance, uh, at action and, and, you know, visual stuff and fast cutting and, and all stuff that he does so wonderfully. And I also thought, okay, it's very scary to step into his shoes, so to speak, with Simon and Nick. Um, but what would I do that's different and how would I do it my way? And the idea of getting sort of a naturalistic comedy performance from a bunch of pixels was a really cool thing that I wanted, a cool challenge that turned out to be really, really hard and had many, many stages, but was ultimately extremely satisfying at the well, end that's, of it. That's the thing. Paul is... There, there is a casualness to him as an effect that after a while means you stop thinking about it as an effect. He does work as a character and he does end up occupying such a major part of the film. Um, it, it is sort of an act of faith, isn't it? And, and with you guys on set, that had to be such a, a jump to make for you as a director in terms of thinking about, okay, what is this eventually going to be? Yeah, because directing, directing a CGI character is kind of like giving an actor, you know, a direction via Twitter and then finding out a year later what they did. I mean, you just, <laughs> you have, it is a huge, and also Simon and Nick were very bold in how they wrote the script. They made Paul kind of the most nuanced character. They play straight man to him often in the film. They, they let him have a lot of the best lines. You know, people are used to seeing Simon and Nick being the central characters in the movie. And in this case, there's this interloper who gets to steal the spotlight for quite a bit of the movie, and he doesn't exist, and was a stick with ping pong balls for eyes for the duration of shooting, and a bunch of other things, including Joe Latrulio's voice. And, and that's, that's interesting, because Joe has such a great, I, I love Joe and Bill together in the movie, and I think that they, they work really well as a team in sort of their yeah. mini movie that's happening over here. Um, but to have Joe be there physically on set to sort of give them something to react to voice-wise, uh, how important was that? And then how much of Joe then bled into what Seth came in and did? Well, it, it was kind of a back and forth thing. The, the performance of Paul started with Seth. Um, in pre-production, we put Seth in a motion capture suit and we ran through the movie like a play and just did it a few times in a row over the course of five days and videotaped everything Seth did. And Seth was wearing this camera that was attached to his face that makes him look like, you know, Neil Young. Uh, at Massey Hall, it's like a harmonica, but it's a camera shooting his face with like little X's all over it, so it's incredibly distracting. Seth looks like a bike messenger from space with X's on his face. And, um, and, and you know, so Seth did a version of the character, but it was, you know, because you're not actually shooting on set, and everyone's, n no one, the energy's never quite right, because it changes when you're on set, when everyone's really in character. But we got a bunch of ideas, and Seth did a bunch of improv, and we, we had a, a a blueprint for who Paul was. And Joe, God bless him, took it really seriously. I asked him to do this, it was a huge favor. We realized he, his character and Paul don't really interact that much in the movie that, we could, that he could really jump back and forth. So he would watch the tapes of what Seth had done. We made all these quick times for him of the scene so he could study Seth's improvs and what he, you know, little nuances, and he would bring them in. But then he'd improv on top of it. So, I mean, I remember just, being freaked out about the fact that I knew that I wanted Seth to do it. I knew Seth was going off to make Green Hornet. He couldn't be on set. We probably couldn't afford to pay him to be on set and stand there and deliver lines off camera. And uh, and I was rewatching E.T. and thinking like, so much of what makes E.T. work are the actors. Those little kids give the most amazing yeah. performances. They make you believe they're talking to an alien, that they're having these insane conversations with an alien. And uh, and I thought, well, Simon and Nick need the comedy version of that. And in comedy, they need someone to play with them because Paul is um, a, a, a chatty little fellow. And so Joe was amazing because Joe is fantastic and, and super funny and can improv better, you know, as good as anybody. He would come up with stuff all the time. And then Seth went and watched cuts of the movie with Joe's voice in it. Um, and redid lines uh, and added to it again, but used a lot of Joe's improvs, and uh, it was a kind of a cool thing that you know 
these two friends of mine were throwing the ball back and forth, so to speak. Well, I think we're at an age where performance, um, there are performances that are being given now on film that sort of push the boundary of what we defined as performance. Um, who, who actually did the, the animation on Paul? What was the house that did that? Um, it's this company, Double Negative, based in London. Okay. And, you know, they've done, they did Inception. They do a lot of Christopher Nolan stuff. They worked on the Batman movies. They worked on the Harry Potter movies and Iron Man movies. And, you know, it was, but it was kind of new for them, even though they've done characters before. It's, it was a different challenge. It took them a while to get their heads around how do you animate a naturalistic performance from a, a creature. And one of the things that helped us design Paul, because um, we were initially, they were designing him in, in the computer animated world, and it never quite felt organic. Like, just the pieces didn't fit together quite perfectly. It was, you know, we're limited by this concept that he had to look like a classic gray alien. Right. Um, and they got close, but it never was fully satisfying. So we ended up hiring this other company, Spectral Motion, in Los Angeles. Sure. that does a lot of stuff for Guillermo del Toro, oh, and they've worked work. with Double Negative. And it was really when they started to get one of their sculptors making Paul out of clay and giving him an anatomy, and just you know, just getting the sense that the tendons in his neck could actually support a head like that, and all the little tiny details. And this guy, you know, was a true artist, made Paul just kind of click in a way that gave him personality and yet still fulfilled the need for him to look like a classic alien. The key is the eyes and how relatable the eyes are. And you guys get that extra added benefit is that they're dinner plates. They're gigantic on Paul. Yeah. So you get so much room for him to react. And um, are you surprised at how well the subtle moments work? Because the big moments, him mooning or him flipping somebody off or things like that, those are those are almost guaranteed crowd pleasers because it's just so outrageous. Yeah. But it's the subtle stuff that to me ultimately sells him in the movie. That's some of my favorite stuff. I mean, and that's stuff that took a lot of work and thought. And we, we you know, um, for instance, the design of the eyes took many, many months. And th this one guy, Jody Johnson at Double Negative, just killed himself to get it right, to give it depth and volume and, and, and reflectivity inside. And they, they did stuff that they'd never done before with eyes. They went way further because they had to work. And just studying... It's all the stuff that kind of happens in your peripheral vision too, like Adam's apple moving and, and little tendons moving when he'd rub his neck or crinkles around his eyes and stuff like that. That Those finishes that take forever, but I don't want the audience to think about. Yeah. But I, one thing I kept saying is Paul has to be a good listener because it's part of what that's going to make him likable. Like when he's listening to Clive and they're finally having their little heart to heart or he's talking to Life Danner's character at the end. If he seems like he's a mensch, like he's actually present and a good listener, he's going to seem a lot more mature than anyone else in the movie. And that's the joke of the film, is that Paul actually is the most mature guy there, even yeah. though he's very ridiculous at times. He's actually a good friend. And uh, um, yeah, that's the stuff that took a lot of thinking and going back and playing with it until, you know, and also integrating 25 lead animators who are doing one character. And those guys, you know, took it, they worked so hard and they really took it seriously and there's hilarious videotapes of them acting things out to each other so they could get reference and uh, uh, it's, it, no, I mean, I have to say, I mean, it's painstakingly slow and it's really hard, but it, uh, as a guy who once, as you know, as a, when I was 10 years old and I had my little Super 8 cameras doing single frame animated stuff, uh, there was a part of me that was so excited to do it at this level of massive technology. Well, congratulations on it, man. And oh, very thanks. nice to sit down with you. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. Take it's a care. pleasure to see you, buddy. Oh, 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 oh,